I'm here tonight to talk about uh, Diesel with you. It's a Rust library to implement type safe SQL queries. And it's a large topic, so this talk will be in a choose your own adventure style. Some slides contain links with questions. And you as an audience can choose which topics we will dive into next. So I've never done this before and I hope it works. So when I ask some questions that are also on the slides, just raise your hands if you want to hear more about that. Let's give it a try. So my name is Pascal Hertleif. Uh, I do web stuff by day and am a Rust enthusiast uh, for several years now, by night. I'm one of the co-organizers here at Rust Cologne. And you can find me on the internet. Uh, my user username is usually KillerCup. So first off, Diesel RS, the, the domain is diesel.rs, uh, is a pretty fancy site. We have a getting started guide that sh should probably um, give you a good idea what diesel can do and how you can use it. We have a fancy logo and we also have extensive API documentation, which for some people is kind of hard to uh, navigate. I'll talk more about that later. It requires the currently newest version of Rust because we use fancy macros for basically everything. So don't use whatever your distribution gives you, just use the latest version. Stable Rust, that is, stable Rust. Also, what is that? Interesting. Well, okay, let's do it to, um, together this, evening, uh, this, this afternoon, so. No idea what just happened. Uh, our currently supported backends are Postgres, with, which has the largest feature set, SQLite, which is great for embedded applications because, well, your final binary also contains SQLite, so you can just copy the binary and don't need to set up any database on the client where you need to run it. And my, as of recent, uh, MySQL, which was a bit of a hassle to uh, set up but should work. So, getting started with Diesel, short introduction. You create a new repository or a new uh, Rust crate. You need to define uh, a database URL in a .env file and then just add the Diesel. Good to go. The main thing Diesel gives you is a really nice query builder. That is, you write, write your queries in Rust, and you can be sure that if they compile, they'll run in production and do what you expect them to do. You don't write SQL, but you can if you really want to, but most features are in the Query Builder and you can just write Rust code. The basic usage of said Query Builder is a bit like this. Can you all read this? Is this enough contrast? All right. So you have this to-do thingy and you call methods on it. Let's just think about to-dos as our database table and we want to filter it. Like we want to find all the to-dos that are not done. So we filter by done, which is equal to false. Then we don't have much time left today, so we we'll limit ourselves to 100 to-dos. Load the to-dos from the database connection, and we get a result, which we can unwrap if you don't care about error handling. What we end up with is a vector of to-dos. You might be thinking, well, there is probably a bit of more stuff involved. So here it is. This is our to-do struct. And we derive a trait, which is here queryable. And then we use infra schema to load the database schema from our database URL and use the DSL to get the things we we're using, that is, the to-dos table and the dance field. 
What do you want to hear next about? Do you want to hear about this DSL I just showed or about infra schema? Who wants to hear about the DSL? And who wants to hear about infra schema? <laughs> Come on, people. It's like 50-50. Well, so who wants to hear about the DSL? Yeah, yeah, OK, OK. OK, that's more activity. I like it. And who wants to hear about infra schema? You want to hear about everything? Yeah. That's great, because <laughs> both are pretty exciting. But the DSL won, so if we'll, we'll like go with it. Yeah, obviously. Uh, <laughs> also, we can talk about everything, but it's going to be a long talk then. So let's start with the DSL. The idea is we need to represent our database schema in Rust. So as you do, we create zero-sized structs for the tables and for all the columns. We implement some fancy traits so we can use filter and load and limit and such for these structs. Magic happens, and we got our DSL. Everything clear so far? Yeah? Yeah? Cool. Then we have intuitive methods, like a mapping from, from what you call select, in SQL is called select, what you call where in SQL is filter, limit is limit, offset is offset, and all that. And the real magic I didn't show you, which was maybe obvious in the previous slide, is that there are lots of methods, and there is a lot of generating types involved. So this is a small example from earlier actually generates a unique type, a select statement type, which I hope you can all read it, uh, contains all the information needed to generate a valid SQL statement. So that is, we have the three columns in their SQL type. We have a mapping to these columns in the structs we generated with the DSL. We have the to-do's table, we have no distinct clause, we have the where clause, and the only part of the where clause we are considering is that we want the, the dance column to be equal to something that is a Boolean. We have no order clause, and we have a limit clause that contains something like an I-64. I don't hear any questions, but I wanted to uh, note that you can ask questions. So how would uh, it look like if you have um, like two filters? How would the type look like? Complicated. Um, where clauses are um, Boolean expressions. So you have and and or and they will be nested. So you have like an and which contains an equal and another equal, or you have an and that contains an and and an or, and so on. So basically, binary tree of Boolean expressions. Please take my turn. So um, this thing is was generated um, by executing the above um, code, and that structure then has a trait implemented to execute it, or? Exactly. Oh, okay. If you understand this slide, diesel will make sense to you. But you don't need to understand it to use it. So if there are no more questions, I'll probably just go on. But I thought this was a good step. So this type can be turned into a SQL statement. And you may ask yourself some other questions like, well, it's a lot of typing. And also, is this what it makes diesel really fast? So what do you want to hear about? How to reduce boilerplate or why diesel is fast? Who wants to hear about reducing boilerplate? OK. 
<laughs> and you, who wants to hear about making diesel fast? It's a yeah. systems programming language. It's all indeed, <laughs> indeed. So let's talk about performance. Everyone wants to hear about performance, but it's really simple. It's just like, well, you have unique types for each query. Like I just showed you, this type represents exactly this query. These queries can also contain bind parameters that will be used in your SQL. Like if you want to represent the user's uh, ID, it, it's, it's not prudent to put like the ID one in the SQL because then you are uh, vulnerable to SQL injections, which are not nice. So use bind parameters to send the query and then all the parameters the query uses to your database. And the first part, that is the query itself, you can save. Because you know you have this type, and this type is a query, so you can save it, cache it, and put it in what's called a prepared statement. So now your database only needs to execute or, or compute the, the query pass once. And the second time you ask for 100 undone to-dos, the database already knows how to fetch these to-dos and it just needs to get all the bind parameters needed for the query, which in this case is none. So the database already has the prepared statement and you just execute it another time. So this is actually faster than typing out the query and submitting it to the database each time. Does it make sense? Yeah? So you case the queries and you get extra performance. And also, it's faster than C because usually in C, you don't really want to implement something like this because it's really, really unsafe to write a SQL statement cache that also involves getting rows back from the database. And because you don't have the type information we have, you need to make sure that actually each row contains exactly this type and you'll have to type it out by hand basically and this will be really unsafe. So Diesel gives this for free and it's thus pretty much the idiomatic way to use Diesel and this is faster than everything idiomatic I've seen before. Do you want to hear about type system shenanigans or some other stuff? Because I just noticed I don't have questions at the end of the slide. We can also talk about something like traits for everything. Does anyone want to hear about traits? Okay, okay, some people. So Diesel has a lot of traits, like, well, you don't want to know how many, but maybe you're interested in how using traits can actually add stuff to this API we saw earlier, like how is filter implemented? And it's simple, you write a trait and then you implement it for everything. Okay, not, not, that, not, not really so simple, but the idea is you have a trait that adds specific information and specific methods to existing traits and types which actually have a bit of constraints on them. So you don't need to read that, but it's basically saying, okay, you have a query of this specific type and you can add like this filter DSL on top of it if you have a query source and you can represent the thing you implemented on, the T in the first line, as a query. And that is also what I alluded to earlier uh, by making the API documentation a bit hard to navigate because the traits are not, as you may have seen in other libraries, interlinked and it's obvious that 
okay, this type implement, implements these five traits, so we can click on one of the traits, and oh, it returns a method that does that. So we know exactly which methods we can actually call on the trait, but it's like we have a generic implementation, and it fits a lot of types. So you return this special select clause I showed earlier, and before calling load on that, you may want to also add an offset. We limited this by 100 to-dos, but maybe you don't want to have 100 to-dos, but the next 100 to-dos, like we, like an, actually an offset. I just explained what an offset is. The second page, basically, of our to-dos. But this special select clause we saw earlier, you, you, you don't find that in the documentation because it's a type that represents the, the SQL query itself. So all traits are implemented pretty generically. And my tip for searching this documentation is just search for what you would call the method yourself. Like if you want to search for something that adds an offset, search for offset, and Rustoc will show you that there is a trait that implements offset. And you will probably recognize that this trait is implemented generically and implemented in a way that everything that can be a query has, or most of the things that can be a query has an offset method, so you can use it. And you don't need to be shy, and you don't need to, like, navigate Rustock by yourself and see, oh, maybe we can add that and maybe I can use that. Just search for it and try it out. That's my, my probably the most important advice I can give you. There is a lot of stuff in there. Many, many traits and methods have documentation. It's a bit hard to find sometimes, but it's all there. Okay. There are two questions, as I want to say always, but we also already saw a counterexample of that. Uh, do you need to implement these traits yourself? Uh, may maybe not. Or do you, do you understand what this SQL type stuff was about we saw earlier? So who wants to know about count generation? OK, two, two people. Two people. And who wants to know what's the deal with SQL type? More people. OK, OK. So one of the, the cornerstones of how diesel uh, can, can generate your queries is that it knows how to transform a Rust structure you wrote to something that SQL can represent, and vice versa. That is, there are some SQL types, and there are some Rust types, and there are ways to convert between them. Some examples are that you have a schema, maybe generated, and this schema is full of SQL types because it represents your database schema, which <laughs> obviously uses SQL types. And then you yourself defined a structure like we have seen earlier, the to-do structure, which uses types you want to use, that is Rust types. And from, from SQL to Rust, there's a trait called from SQL, and the other way around is called to SQL. Pretty self-explanatory, I think. And most of these map one to one, that is, if you have a float SQL type, it's actually an F32 in Rust. If you have a big integer, it's an I64. But other types are not so simple because they can be implemented for several Rust types. Like if you use a standard time library or the semi-standard time library or chrono, they both can represent a timestamp. And maybe you can also put it into an integer. So you need to be careful and these the documentation on that is, is more extensive because the timestamp documentation, for example, let me just open that over here, if I can manage that, contains 
the helpful information that to SQL impulse and from SQL impulse both have two versions. And also, to use Chrono, you need to compile Diesel with a feature called Chrono because it is an external library and we don't want to have every Diesel user compiled if they don't need to use it. Okay. But now, back to the question, do you need to implement this yourself? There's only one question, so I, I, I really need to take this link. And it doesn't even work, what? <laughs> oh God, I should have tested that. But nevertheless, it's another part of the magic. It's a table macro, which allows you to basically define a SQL table in your Rust code. And this generates all the DSL structures we saw earlier. It's a macro that is quite easy to understand. You just call a table, say what's the table name and what's the primary key, and then you map columns to SQL types. Important thing is to remember that these are SQL types. That is, integer is not a Rust type, and, and text and bool are also not Rust types. This macro call expands to something like, what? Oh my god, oh my god. I think it opened it in another window. And I also don't. What? Okay. I still had that one open. This is what the table macro expands to. It introduces two modules, the columns module and the DSL module. It's introducing structs for all the fields and also some, some for other things like star, which is just like from select star in SQL and table, which is representing the, sta the table and not the columns and some constants like a tuple of all the columns and type definitions for convenience. Let's look at the DSL module, which pretty boring, it just, that, that's all we have been working with so far. It's the, the zero size structs I mentioned earlier. It's one renamed, the to-do struct renamed, it's just the same thing as the table, and the column struct. And if we have a look at like this struct, we can see it's zero size structure, so only represented at compile time for us, and it implements all these traits. It's ex expression, query fragment, and a lot of other stuff. And this allows us to basically see, okay, we can represent this in SQL, we can call filter on it, we can call where, uh, we can call order on it, we can call select on it, and everything else. It's really a lot of code that is generated here. Yeah, please. Please wait for the microphone. Oh. Yeah. Um, table macro. Um, you basically defined a table in code. Can that be used to bypass this um, inferior schema and not having to um, call a database and extract the types? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> it's basically. If do you want? Do you all want to hear about infra schema and how this uh, corresponds to table? because that's the next thing on my list. <laughs> yeah. The schema inference you, you just uh, talked about is this micro call we saw earlier. It's run at compile time and queries the database. Hey, database, what's the actual schema using here? Um, and it gets the information back from the database and all it does is generate these micro calls. So, it's actually the other way around. You don't use macro to circumvent infra schema, you use infra schema to not have to define the macro calls. Okay. Yeah, but it's the right thinking. And also, it has a bunch of caveats you need to know. Like, for example, if you have a database running on your development machine that has a different schema than your production machine, it can't be used at compile time to generate the schema for your production machine, obviously. 
and your, data, your dev machine actually needs to run a database. I hope that's okay with you, but I've heard complaints from people like, I want to develop this application and I don't want to set up Postgres on my machine. So you need to think about that. And for all these people, there is a diesel print schema command that prints on the command line basically all the table calls info schema generates. So if one developer wants to use info schema and another developer doesn't, they can find a compromise by the first one just using print schema, putting that into version control, and all developers can see, hey, that's the schema this guy was working with. That's also a nice bridge to our next two questions. This, this is basically all about building up a database schema. So who wants to know about database migrations? A lot of people. And who wants to know what's up with this diesel tool? Now, let's talk about migrations. So, migrations are just files. You put them into, by, by convention, you put them into a migrations directory and into subdirectories with a daytime prefix so they will be ordered nicely and maybe a name. And then you just create two files an up file and a down file, and both are SQL. Like you just write actual SQL statements in there, like create table to do's with an ID, a title, and a done flag, I uh, think we got earlier. And in the down file, it's just the inverse. That is, you drop the data, uh, you, you drop the to do's table. And Diesel has some convenience tool for that. The diesel CLI tool also has mig a migration subcommand that can generate these files for you with the correct names and timestamps and all that. You can apply them and you can reward them. So now, do you want to hear about the CLI tool? <laughs> <laughs> ah, the diesel CLI tool. It's really easy. Every diesel uh, installation is, uh, uh, every crate using diesel assumes that you will use diesel's migration tool. So you probably need to install the CLI tool to generate that. And it also uh, needs some setup involved. So it sets up like a, a table in your database, keeping track of which schema um, migrations you applied and all that. And also it has a nice uh, print schema we saw earlier. It can be installed just by using cargo install. I think there are, are currently no binary distributions, but it's an easy installation. And if you can compile diesel, you can probably also compile this tool. It just installs this like all other cargo binaries into your home directory, I think. So it's not a system-wide thing. And this is also a, a tool that doesn't change that frequently. So it can be used across multiple diesel versions. And you can have as many diesel projects as you want to, and to manage it with this. As I said, it sets up your database. It manages your migrations. And as we have already seen, it can print your schema. OK. Actually, I think you have already talked about both these points, the migrations and the schema printing. But maybe we can talk about type system shenanigans. Yeah, you up for that? Or do you really want to talk about testing diesel? Later on. Who wants to talk about testing? Who wants to talk about type systems? Okay, people want to hear about type systems. So, I, I mentioned in the introduction earlier that there are some points the Rust type system is not really good at. And one of this is that we have a macro that implements our column types for tuples. And it's, well, 
it's hard to say how many columns people have in their databases, but we have feature flags to implement this for tuples of the length of up to 52 elements. So it's nice to have macros generating trade implementations for tuples. If you want to hear more about that, just ask me. It would not fit on the slide. All the traits we saw earlier are generic over the backend type we're actually using. That is, we have Postgres, SQLite, and MySQL. And some features are only available on some backends. Like, we support the Postgres JSON type, so you can't use it with SQLite currently. We support the returning clause in Postgres, so you can have inserts which give you back some part of the data you just inserted, like the ID or the whole data set. And that does only work on Postgres, so you can't use it on MySQL. And we ensure that at compile time by having everything generic over the backend type. It's quite nice. Do you want to hear about testing diesel now? <laughs> no, no? <laughs> I'll go through it quickly. So we have unit tests. Unit tests are the, the basis for every testing thing. And most unit tests we have are for our helper functions and conversion things. Like we need to ensure that queries with different types have different IDs. That's not really readable on the slide, but I hope you can guess what it means. And we also need to test the conversion functions from a bit more involved type conversions, like date time stuff. It's, it's basically like you need to ensure that the conversion from, from Rust to SQL to Rust works, and unit tests are a good way to do that. But more on that later. We also have integration tests, which assume that you are a diesel, a diesel user and want to do some stuff. So we run some queries and see that the queries actually contain what we want them to contain. And Every example you see in our API documentation is actually a test because doc tests are a thing in Rust and it's great to make use of them. And actually, if we were to show in our API documentation everything the test uh, needs a setup, they'll all contain the struct definition and the table macro call and all that. So we're actually just using this the test every API documentation example that gets to a certain size includes a doc test setup RS. And if you happen to be writing a library that you want to write documentation tests for and they get kind of out of hand, it's a pretty nice way to do that. Just put all the setup code in an external file and include it. Because you can't, you, you don't want to makes this public API, but including a file is always a possibility. Also, for the mentioned round trips, we use QuickCheck. That is, we have implementations for all the types, and arbitrary, uh, that is, it's a trade for QuickCheck, it's called arbitrary uh, implementation for all the types. So we can generate data that fits into let's say a timestamp, and we can represent this in Rust. Send it to the database, see what we can get back, and convert this Rust, and hopefully they are the same. It's really nice to find, or, or to not write a lot of examples, but just find all the examples that are relevant. And the Rust quick check library, as all good quick check libraries, also includes a way to minimize your result set and find uh, small counterexamples. For example, if the timestamp of zero was a problem, 
it'll tell us. So if you haven't been using QuickCheck for your tests, it's really great and you should give it a try. I mentioned earlier that we want to have your project not compile with invalid queries. That is, you write a query that can't possibly fit your schema and it should not compile. To ensure that, we have the compile test tool, which is a library that you give some Rust files and it tries to compile all of them and you have annotations in there um, to say, hey, we want to uh, ensure that at this line, this error is wrong. Like a compile time error containing the word type mismatch or something like that, or method not uh, implemented. And it's actually the same tool that the Rust compiler itself or linting tools like Clippy use. So if you want to have an API that you can uh, be sure will fail to compile in certain cases, give it a try. A compile test is really nice for that. So, that was all from me. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please uh, grab a microphone and ask them. You told us a lot, lot about um, those uh, strongly typed uh, queries. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> what about type Erasure, um, is it possible to, um, like for example, uh, uh, write a command line tool where the user um, uh, yeah, decides, okay, I want to build a query now interactively uh, and I want to filter it and, uh, okay, the command line tool, uh, yeah, decides to use Deezer, but now it doesn't know uh, if it, yeah, will apply a filter or not. Um, so it would have to erase um, the type. Is, is that a thing? That <laughs> is a thing. We have box queries. So that is, you can turn each query into a box of a trade object. And I'm pretty sure you can use that to implement such a command line tool. Cool. Might be a new question. Uh, but I only checked out the documentation on diesel.rs and one thing that I found confusing was that the uh, Rust diesel representation of my query looked totally different to the MySQL query. I mean, uh, there's some parameters which uh, just don't match in my brain somehow from, from the Rust version to write stuff and from the from the SQL version that would come out of it. So is, was that a design decision that you think was, was uh, smart or do you think that actually that is not true and most of the queries look the same in, in both representations? Can you give an, a concrete example? Uh, can you go to the main diesel website maybe? There's one on the start page. Uh, go to... Uh, yeah, go to complex queries on top. So uh, there's some, well, this actually looks pretty reasonable. <laughs> 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 go to inserting data. Uh, inserting data. That's more stuff below. No. <laughs> Honestly, that all looks pretty much what I would expect. It's kind of confusing now. Sorry to disappoint then. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's awesome then. Uh, strange. Can you go uh, to the very top and then there, uh, go to the doc, docs? Uh, API yeah, docs? Um, API docs. API docs or guides? Uh, no, no, please go to the other one. <laughs> uh, uh, guides, yeah. Yeah. Trying to find a counter example, which I, yeah. There are some, here are some queries. Okay, so what would that return? Something like a select, I don't know. It returns a post. You can see it in the load. A single post. 
Okay, can I, can I see the the SQL statement for that? Is that somewhere? No. No. Okay. Would be nice to add it to to the side uh, to see what is coming out of that. But yeah. yeah. Uh, since we can't find an example and all of the other ones look good, probably I should stop now. <laughs> 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 uh, just good job then. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So. Uh, in, in general, it's not possible to represent all valid SQL queries currently in Diesel. So maybe there are some constructs you want to use but can't use, so you need a workaround. But basically, they were pretty idiomatic SQL to me so far, in contrast to some other ORMs, to be honest. Um, one question, and that's about like for example, if I have a this to do type, uh, is it? It's not like done as a boolean in your example, but if done is like a state uh, or it's like state, and then it's a to do state, for example, and then I have for a key of another table which is like open in progress done. Um, so my question is, how do you get this presented with the um, state in Rust? For example, in Java, I know I would uh, create an enum where I have like three ta uh, three enum values, like open, in progress, done. And I would need something like that, I expect, in my Rust code as well, because somewhere I need this constant three ta things. Yes. We currently do not support native Postgres enumeration types. And I don't think, well, I think MySQL has enums, but they're like C enums that convert to an integer, so, so maybe you can use that. And SQLite does not have enums. But in general, your Rust enums, you need to implement to and from SQL yourself for. So if you want, if, if you define an enum type in Rust, Diesel doesn't know it can be converted to SQL and it cannot know how to transform SQL to make your enumeration type. So you need to implement these yourself. Is that what you were trying to ask? So I'm if I sure. understand correctly, I would, if I want to, uh, like for example, list all to-dos with state open, I would create an, a Rust enum with, with um, open um, in progress done, mm -hmm. and then I have to do the two, um, so to uh, the conversion to the SQL type manually. Or yes, you need to implement to and from SQL yeah. these traits. But you also, of course, need to think about how you represent this in the database. Actually, like yeah. if, if you want to use a string, it's probably an easy conversion, but if you want to use a custom SQL type, it's a bit more involved. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I understood that there's a lot of type magic stuff. So how are compile times for all the queries? <laughs> I, I, I try to write a um, uh, shell script that runs cargo check on the whole of the diesel repository with several crates in it. And I was really surprised at first because it was like done in five seconds. But then I noticed that I didn't actually change a file deep inside the diesel core crate. So that blew it up to 50 seconds. In general, it's a one-off cost so because your application will probably use diesel, compile it once, and then after like 40 seconds or so, you have your copy of diesel. Um, I actually don't mean the compile time of the diesel crate itself, but the compile time for your crate when you're oh. writing queries in the DSL. I mean, does it not take much time or? I have not measured anything, okay. but it, it surprised me if it was really a thing that blew up compile times. Because the queries, of course, are nested types and they need to be resolved, 
but also you are probably not writing hundreds of queries, but more like tens of queries, so that's okay. Um, the table macro again. Am I able to rename um, the stuff to my um, Rust drugs then? Because sometimes in a database you, have, database you have stupid names. That's a question we get surprisingly uh, often because apparently a lot of people have databases with stupid names of their columns. Um, I'm not sure if we actually implemented it yet, but we want to. Like a rename in SETI. <laughs> Actually, that was the example we got, and we were like, well, but actually it's, it's a lot of work and stuff. But I think um, there was an open issue, and also uh, a design we want to implement. So if you want to get involved, <laughs> maybe you can give it a try. <laughs> It's really interesting stuff. Okay. So, <laughs> but I don't think we have uh, anything like that currently. And another question. When I um, tried out this error chain thing is there, I recognized that I could put comments into the macros and that they appeared in the documentation. Does it work here with the table um, macro too? Because I saw you had a, for your to-dos, you had a generated documentation there, the standard generated um, Rust doc, and if you had documentation in there, that would be really cool because you already have set types and put, can put documentation there. I don't think it's currently possible because the table macro is actually really simple and our happy pass is you use infra schema and don't write it yourself. So okay. that's, that's not something we put much effort in to make this nice for you to write. But it's certainly possible and shouldn't be much work. So. And the thing with the 52 um, element tuple, is that why you asked for this age list or had this made this post? I think it was you on the it was diesel repository. Yeah. It's actually, well, Sean suggested it. Sean Griffin is the other, the, the, the core author of diesel. Uh, he wrote most of the code. And it's the, the tuple thing is something we basically stumble upon every so often because if you want to select multiple columns, you need to have tuples. If you want to have like nice error messages and not see a whole bunch of tuples, you need to have something else in tuples. But if you need to, well, if you if you are talking about compile times and you have an, a trait implementation or implementation of several traits and then have that over 52 variants. Like, I, I can't help you. Any. This is like, so half of our compile time is just compiling this one trait for, for several tuples. So HLists is a way to do that, but it's probably uh, too much to explain here. Why 52? Why not 42? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. We have uh, several feature flags. I think by default it's only like 12 or so because same database schemas should not have so many columns. But there is a large tables and the uh, huge tables fe feature you can uh, enable. And then you get like I don't know, 32 and, and 52 for some reason, I have no idea. But you should not have more than 52 columns in your database table. Actually, um, expanding on that, if I remember correctly, Rust itself only implements things for tuples up to 12 entries, right? Yes, um, and it's the same for arrays as well. Yes, probably. Um, does that ever create problems for users that would use like huge tables or large tables or something like that? Because you can't I don't know if you have accessors for like the 13th element, but like in that have. vein. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your accessors are just are there, but trait implementations in the standard library that work on tuples are not there, and you need to do them by yourself. But 
so far it's still possible to do what you want and uh, people with large tables can be happy with their large tables. Any more questions? Well then, thanks again for listening. The slides are available here and maybe you can also comment uh, at the meetup if this style of presentation was anything you liked. I thought I'd give it a try because there are so many interconnected topics. Just let me know. <laughs>